Thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. A Glimpse of the Kingdom can remain free because of generous donors like you. If you'd like to donate, feel free to do so online, or you can send payments through Facebook Messenger. Don't forget to tell your friends about it so that they can enjoy this ministry as well. Be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any podcasts. You can listen to my daddy every single day, like in the gym, in the car, or just at home. Glimpse of the Kingdom is awesome! Hello, and thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I am David Pendergrass. I received a question a while back I thought I'd respond to, and sorry for the delay in responding, Zachary. Zachary said, Hi, David. I've been reading about the new perspectives on Paul, particularly Tom Wright's views in opposition to it, and I was just wondering what your view of it is. I'm really confused, and I was hoping you could help me give some insight to it. Well, Zachary, that is a great question and a biggie. Uh, We actually typically call it the new perspective on Paul, In a nutshell, I did a podcast as well on this uh, that talks about from Romans 7. But in a nutshell, for a long, 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 long time, ever since usually most people attribute Martin Luther, Martin Luther, has his view of how to read Paul has dominated Protestant interpretation of Paul. Uh, Martin Luther's view, in a nutshell, I mean, this is true. If you read Martin Luther's work, Martin Luther was one of the most well-known reformers, so Guy, he's not the only one, but he's one probably the most well-known reformer, Martin Luther. Martin Luther was a German, and he was Catholic, and he saw several things going on in the Catholicism of his day. But when he started reading the New Testament really, really well in original languages, he said, "Man, and I compare the New Testament to what I see around me, I see some discrepancies." So he wanted to have a discussion about it with his Roman Catholic brethren. And he wrote it down in 95 Theses, this document that said, these are things I don't see in the Bible. He nailed it to the church, Wittgenberg, and there, thems were fighting words. It was the, the match that lit the powder keg. All over Europe, this kind of stuff had been bothering people for a long time. And Martin Luther's thes- 95 Theses really, as it were, set the match. And he was, in a, nut, in a short story, was brought in and questioned and considered a heretic and excommunicated and whatever. Martin Luther didn't want all that to happen. He wanted to be a Roman Catholic. He just wanted to reform the church, but instead he started a massive new movement. And then all over Europe, it became popular over the next couple decades for other authors to say, yeah, yeah, I've been thinking this stuff too. And it just, it just boom, 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 almost like another analogy, like dominoes. But when you read Martin Luther, he said some, I think, some really great, compelling things. He really emphasized grace, grace alone, faith alone. You don't need to do any other rituals. You don't work for it. It's all the grace of Jesus. It's just that when he reads Paul, when you read the Apostle Paul, like the book of Galatians particularly, and and, almost any document, but certainly Galatians, Paul has in mind certain opponents. When you read Martin Luther, Paul's opponents sure sound and smell like the Roman Catholics of his day. So most Protestant interpreters forever have read Paul through the lens of Luther and made Jews like the Roman Catholics and Martin Luther's perception legalist because Luther was fighting against his perception that Roman Catholics are trying to earn their way. They're trying to earn salvation. So when Protestant reformers post Martin Luther read the New Testament, they did this basically in a nutshell, the same thing. It would mean that when Paul is writing to Jews, all the Jews are legalist. And so every time a Roman Catholic mentions the law, Martin Luther says, see, look at here, Paul addressed the law right here. Well, of course, that's highly problematic. One is because Paul didn't know what a Roman Catholic was. That was 1,500 years before a Roman Catholic existed. So we can't be talking about Roman Catholics. But Martin Luther was so influenced by his contemporaneous uh, milieu that he he just interpreted this way. It's almost like he couldn't not do it. I'm guessing. But the church just the Protestant church bought it all. Basically, the Roman Catholic Church did it. Uh, they were influenced by him, but not nearly as much as Protestants were. Orthodox Church has always kind of done their own thing. But the Protestant Church to this day, Baptist, Methodist, uh, I mean, on and on it goes. Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, Presbyterian, on and on. Basically, every single sermon, every single preacher, everybody, every time, all the time, 
everybody, every Sunday school, every Bible study, sermon, ever my entire life, always, they always present Jews as legalist. They are meticulous, tedious, anal retentive, OCD, legalist, just in the South, we say, bless their heart. They just really trying to earn their way to, to God. And that's their problem. And you have verses like in John's gospel, the early on in John's gospel, in John chapter one, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses and or but grace and truth came about through Jesus Christ. And so they use those verses and many more to think that what Jews really had was a law, a rule book, and the rules had to be followed, and they tried their best every day, and it was a heavy, heavy, heavy burden, and they were just so sunk, and the Pharisees thought they were all righteous and good, but the rule they followed the rules, but they really didn't, but they were they were hypocrites. They, they told everybody and act like they followed the rules, but they didn't. They're a bunch of hypocrites. And so everybody thinks you've got to follow the rules. Some at least know they can't. Others know they can't. They're just pretending. In comes Jesus and says, no, 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 no. It's not about earning your way to God. It's all about grace. So stop trying to earn your way and give grace. And so every single time Pharisees mention Pharisee becomes synonymous with legalist. And today in modern English culture, it still is. If someone is a Pharisee, it means they're legalist. They're rule-based. They're trying to earn something by rules or keeping the commandments. Well, that just was the dominant view. And in the 1950s and 60s, there's a movement in New Testament interpreters that started to change things. And they started to say, what if we didn't read the New Testament, and certainly Paul's literature, uh, but even the Gospels itself, we didn't read the New Testament through the lens of Martin Luther and think everybody who's a legalist really isn't a legalist. Is it really true that the Jews really thought they were trying to earn salvation? Let's look at this historically. And when they did that, certain scholars who are well-known wrote articles and then books. A guy like Christer Stendhal at Harvard Divinity School. Very, very influential books. And then through the 70s, what happened, it became very popular. Then in the late 70s, a guy named Ed Sanders wrote a book, Paul and Judaism. And this became the the major watershed deal. I mean, this 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 book became a profoundly influential work in the New, New Testament studies. To this day... Everybody knows E.P. Sanders' book. They quote from it or cite it. Or, I mean, it's just the big book. He's not the only scholar, like I said. There's many scholars before, and then Stendhal and others, and led up to E.P. Sanders' massive tome. And uh, Sanders came up with an expression called covenantal gnomism. Covenantal gnomism. Covenantal gnomism belief that it is the, basically the argument is that Jews didn't think that they had to earn their way to God, to, to, to be saved, you might say. In fact, they didn't talk a lot about salvation. He argued, and many did, uh, many still do, that Jews believed that the law was grace. The law was just a grace gift. The Jews didn't earn the right to receive Torah. God just gave it to them. And they, uh, so they acted out the commandments. They lived like covenant Jews, not because they were trying to earn the covenant, but because they had one. So covenantal, because there's a covenant, but nomism, it means law. They kept the law because they had the covenant. It's like saying, uh, Sanders, he might even say this somewhere, but but I use the analogy all the time. I'm married. I stay faithful to my wife. I wear my wedding ring. I come home and sleep in the same bed with her every night, whatever. I don't do these things to earn my marriage. I'm already married. I do them because I am married. And if someone said, you just do it because you're a legalist. You're just trying to earn your marriage. That would be stupid. I'd say, that's that's stupid. I'm already married. I was married a long time ago. It's like that with the law. They would New Testament scholars uh, would say, no, the Jews thought they were married to God. Um, that's a metaphor. That's a metaphor. And that was a grace. The fact that God came to them and said, hey, let's get married. They went, yes. And they got married to someone who, way up their social ladder. <laughs> and they wanted to act like they're married. And the way they made it into the world to come, you might say, is by keeping the covenant commandments to, to stay faithful as the people of God. And so, so when the Apostle Paul talks about the works of the law, particularly in Galatians, how they fail you and they lead to death and sin, the works of the law, it's not legalism and it's not Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic legalism that Martin Luther thought it was. So the argument goes. Instead, these works of the law or the law is shorthand for those things which Jews do that are boundary markers for Jews. 
And really, there are three big ones. There are three big things, three major behaviors that Jews do that non-Jews would never do. So a Gentile would never do these things. First is circumcision. The second is kashrut, so dietary restrictions. You don't eat pork, don't eat all those things found in Leviticus particularly. And you obey and follow and observe the high holy days of Judaism. You know, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, and, and so forth, Passover, Pesach. These are three major things that if you see someone doing them, you know you've met a person who has a covenant with God. And so what Stendhal and others, and then E.P. Sanders and a few others have argued back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, and I'm, I'll am i go to modern Tom Wright in a second too, what they argue was in a nutshell, everybody since Luther has been wrong. The Pharisees weren't a bunch of legalists. Paul's opponents weren't a bunch of legalists. Jews weren't legalists. They were grace-based people. But instead, what Paul is opposing is Jewish ethnical arrogance. <laughs> Ethic er ethnic arrogance. That is to say, they're so hung up on being Jewish that they're wrong. They should focus more on being open to what the Gentiles are doing for God's, or they can be for God, inside of God's people through Jesus. Later on, then after the 80s happened, then the 90s and 2000s, there were a few more major authors that came about who also basically concurred, but had certainly had nuances. There were some big ones. A guy named James D.G. Dunn. His friends call him Jimmy. Jimmy Dunn, uh, I think he's at Glasgow. He's a great New Testament scholar. Uh, of course, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, is another major author. And what happened eventually, I, I used to have this memorized, but there was a time someone called them they call themselves, this is the new perspective on Paul. And so that's where the name comes from. The new perspective on Paul is basically everything that's not Martin Luther influenced. <laughs> so it's new because it's new from the 1500s. I mean, since the 20th, middle of the 1900s, so middle of the 20th century, this is still a modern movement. But it is safe to say a couple things about this movement. One is, not everyone in the so-called new perspective on Paul camp, they don't all believe the same thing. That's okay. They do have differences. They do. Uh, and you need to read the authors to know exactly what the distinctions are. And sometimes there are books and articles and essays that do nothing but delineate those differences. That would really help you if you're really interested in those distinctions. Sometimes the authors themselves will say, I agree with, you know, Tom will say this. N.T. Wright will say, well, I agree with Jimmy Dunn on blank, 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 but I totally disagree on blah, 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 blah. Uh, Richard Hayes at Duke is another one I think it fits the new, new perspective and some others. It's safe to say there's distinctions. The second thing is it's safe to say that most New Testament scholars in general have bought into the view. In general, most New Testament scholars in the world do not read the New Testament like almost everybody in the church does. So in New Testament scholarship, when we read Pharisee, we don't think legalist. When we read works of the flesh, or I mean works of the law, or the law in Galatians, or in Galatians and other texts, most New Testament interpreters do not think poor old legalists are just trying to earn their way to heaven. Most people will immediately think ethnic boundaries. Now, the third thing I'm saying is not everyone agrees. There are still some very intelligent, educated people who do not find the new perspective on Paul convincing. There are not as many. They're on the minority. Uh, but they're out there. Uh, I, I had a professor who very much disagreed with the new perspective on Paul. Uh, and he wrote pretty, oh, well, he wrote several things about it. But in class, he sure talked about it a good bit in my PhD. Uh, he didn't buy into it for various reasons. And so he, he's not alone. I mean, there's different people who don't find it fully convincing. But nevertheless, I'm not here to convince you at all. <laughs> you ask, what is it? And that's what it is. It is a way to read and interpret Paul if you're curious in my view is, in general, I do find it convincing. I don't think all of it is. I don't think it's true that all Jews at all times only thought the law was just grace, grace, grace all the time. I don't find that convincing based on the data. I think there's several examples in the Pseudepigrapha and some of the New Testament that demonstrates that it was not uncommon for certain Jews to think that the way to be in God's people, we might say the word be saved, I don't like that term, and I'll, I guess I'll tell you why in a second. But to be part of God's covenant means you had to obey it. You had to obey it, or you did not make entrance into the world to come. And I do not think that's the dominant view, but I do think that is a view. 
And therefore, I don't think when Paul writes about the works of the law, he only has in mind those ethnic boundary markers. I think he's also addressing some people who think, no, Paul, you've got to do the rules or else. Uh, so in general, though, I do think we should never read the New Testament through the lens of Martin Luther or any other human being. John Wesley, uh, certainly not John Calvin. I mean, I don't. these are maybe some real good, smart people. But all through the medieval ages, all the time, all the way up to the modern historical critical method, like the mid-20th century when all this breakthrough happened, none of them fully grasped the historical critical method. Now, I don't worship the historical critical method, but I think by far it is the very best method used to interpret the Bible. And that is, namely, locating the texts and ideas represented in the texts within their historical and literary context. To me, that's overwhelmingly commonsensical. I don't care what Luther says about Romans. I don't care what John Calvin says about Romans. I care what Paul said about Romans. And I care what the Apostle Paul meant in the words he said of what Jews were saying in the time period and what other Christians were saying in the time period. Praise God, there's all kinds of scholarship on these exact topics. And in, and not being mean, I'm not being condescending, I really mean it, praise God, because it means there's a whole huge body of material. When you go and get your PhD, you don't read, okay, okay. When many people go get their PhDs at great large schools, you don't read literature that just simply fits your theological views. You, in the PhD level, most people are, are overwhelmingly dominated in their education by the historical critical method. It's not the only method. It's not it. I was also trained a whole lot in the narrative and literary um, uh, reading of the text, a whole lot in my PhD. All I'm saying is it's bedrock. It's so commonsensical now. You're hard-pressed to find any PhD studies anywhere that does not assume the basic tenets of histor historical critical methodology. Um uh, you might add on other things, but it's still considered like the kind of like the queen of the sciences that theology used to be called. But anyway, having said that, that's one of the reasons why I instantaneously will listen to anybody more than Martin Luther or anybody when they say, well, I think in the ancient world, what Jews would have thought, and here's my evidence, you've got my attention immediately. I guess one little, f maybe it's a final note. I know I've read people like John Piper, who, I'm saying this loosely, but he hates the new Pauline perspective. John Piper is a well-known pastor who's a well-known Calvinist and he, he wrote a whole book against N. T. Tom Wright on justification, some other stuff. And he, I mean, a lot of people, particularly in the church, there's just a, I can't, I can't overemphasize this fact that most churches preach constantly this idea that Pharisee and opponents of Paul are just a bunch of legalists and Jesus and Paul are all about grace. And yet in the academy, Virtually no one reads it that way. This is one of the most gigantic, huge discrepancies between what we do in the academy or the church. The church is, I don't know, what, um, almost 70 years behind the times on this issue. And because of that, since this, some of this is trickling out, uh, it, it, there's a massive pushback. It can't mean that, uh, Tom, right? It can't be that Jimmy Dunn. It can't be Sanders because... When you say it that way, it sounds like Jesus died for nothing and on and on. In other words, there's a massive, in my opinion, a massive emotional, psychological pushback. Not that I have yet to read any person who opposes it. Um, uh, Carte Blanche, who, who didn't give any evidence for it. The only people I've read who gave evidence against it, who didn't write it out Carte Blanche, were scholars, like my professor. The one guy I mentioned who said, I said uh, who, who didn't agree with it. He wrote essays and scholarly level stuff that gave evidence for his views. And even then, he didn't read it straight through the lens of Martin Luther. He just thought the new Pauline perspective as it was presented wasn't fully convincing. I'm more convinced than my professor, my former professor was. I am more convinced than he was. Uh, but nevertheless, he didn't say, you can't do that because Jesus is God. Or I mean, it wasn't just, it's not Sunday school. This is scholarship. So that's a big difference. So it does have been online or blogs and all that stuff. You might find people who just dismiss it out of hand or associate New Pauline Perspective with Satan. I mean, I've heard all kinds of New Pauline Perspective is liberal. It's leftist. It's they don't care about the gospel. Poor Tom Wright. He gets accused everywhere all the time, left and right. Liberals think he's fundamentalist. Fundamentalists think he is the most liberal thing possible. And I think they're both wrong. Uh, I don't concur with everything Tom Wright says, and that's fine. He wouldn't concur with everything I say. 
But overall, I think his view on this is quite convincing. But there's some quick thoughts about that. God bless you. Keep reading and uh, keep studying. That's some really good stuff to learn about. Oh, and a, a final encouragement. If if you've never heard anything I've said in this whole podcast, if everything I, basically every word I said was novel to you, uh, you're not alone. I didn't hear about the new Pauline perspective until I first started my PhD. Well, that's that's ridiculous. I should have heard this in my undergraduate and in my master's, and of course my PhD. But again, that demonstrates how far behind the church is, and even some some schools are. Uh, nevertheless, it doesn't mean it's all right. It doesn't mean they're behind, therefore they're all wrong. I'm just saying they have full the church and a lot and some schools at the undergrad and master level still haven't fully come to grips with the arguments being made for the new Pauline perspective. And that's my point. So there's a lot more there. If you want to read, keep reading. If you want more literature, I'll be happy to give it. But you're on the right track with Tom Wright and some others. Uh, but I would maybe read E.P. Sanders, Tom Wright, Jimmy Dunn on these issues, and I think they'll give you a lot more insight. God bless you. See you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. I really do hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you'll listen more. If you want more, go to davidpendergrass.com. There are tabs at the top that let you have access to all the podcasts I've recorded, to sermons I've done, uh, books I've written. They're all there at davidpendergrass.com. You can also check me out on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom, facebook.com forward slash glimpse of the kingdom. And also look at my Twitter feed at glimpse the king or at Dr. D. Pendergrass, at Dr. D. Pendergrass. There are tons of ways reached out. I hope you will. Send me your questions. Send me your comments. If you'd like to support the ministries of Glimpse of the Kingdom, you can also find ways to give online on davidpendergrass.com. If you'd like for me to come and do some consulting, check out my website, davidpendergrassconsulting.com, and I'll be happy to come out and speak to your organization and help and train any way I can. God bless you. See you online.